now, Dakota Ring Theater presents the continuing adventures of Canada's greatest superhero, that scourge of the underworld, hunter of those who prey upon the innocent, that marvelous masked mystery man known only as the Red Panda! The Red Panda, mysterious crusader for justice, hides his true identity as one of the city's wealthiest men in his never-ending battle against crime and corruption. Only his fiancé, Kit Baxter, who joins him in his quest in the guise of the Flying Squirrel, knows who wears the mask of the Red Panda. This episode, The Crimson Death. Hello, Judge Marcus speaking. No, hello, Mr. Purley. No, I can't say that I'm surprised to have you call. A little disappointed, perhaps, but not surprised. I've already told that reporter of yours that I have no comment to make. Yes, I'm aware that two other members of the sanitarium board have died in the last week. I do read the newspapers, Mr. Purley. Occasionally, I even stoop low enough to read the Chronicle, though I shouldn't like that to be generally known. For the last time, no, I have no interest in being interviewed. The public's right to know is not at risk, sir, as I have no information on the deaths of either Byron Chambers or Walter Grant. Good day, sir. Fool. As if I didn't have enough to worry about. What's that? It sounds like like footsteps on the stairs. It can't be. Operator? Operator, get me the police! Operator! Dead. But I... just... it can't be. Having trouble with your service, Judge. Who is it? Who, who's there? Do you really have to ask? <laughs> Stay back! Stay back! I've called the police! I doubt that very much. I cut the outside line 20 minutes ago. Impossible! I, I just had a call! From Editor Pearlie of the Toronto Chronicle. I'm afraid that was me. The extension rang because I told it to... With my mind. Impossible. You know that it isn't. You know someone who can control simple machines telepathically. And I know he is locked away, where he cannot use his powers to commit any more crimes. Besides, I know Pearlie's voice. I can make my voice sound like anyone I choose. Even you, my dear Judge Marcus. But that's impossible. The Mockingbird is... Is locked away, where she can't hurt any decent people anymore. Decent people like you... And like Byron Chambers and Walter Grant. Stay back! Do you still not guess what is happening here? Do you still wonder who is behind this Crimson Death's head mask? Allow me to make it clear. You! No! No, why would you do this? Why? After what you did to me. After what you made me. They were meant to be gifts. You were meant to protect people. How about we start by protecting them from you? Would you like to see another of the many gifts you gave me? I borrowed this one from Colby Brown. Not much to look at, is it? Just an aura of bright flame around the hands. Nothing special. Please! It never did Colbart burn much good. Please, don't! But then, it was the only club in his bag. I'm begging you! Don't kill me! Oh, I am sorry, Judge Marcus. But sooner or later you would have put it together. One of you would. And I cannot have my secrets known. Please! Franklin! That name means nothing. That man is dead. And in his place stands the beast you have created. A creature of vengeance and hate that you have made. Now, Judge Marcus, you will feel the sting of... The Crimson Death. (laughs) Watch your step, sir. Yes, thank you. And if I might say, sir, it's been a real honor having you fly with us. Oh, well, thank you very much. Not at all. Miss? Thanks. He was very polite. I noticed that. The entire crew was. I don't know when I've had such a courteous trip. You do know that you own this airline, don't you? I do. That's a little disappointing. You'd rather people were nice to you just to be nice? 
Who wouldn't? It's an interesting point. Boy, uh, it's good to be home. You didn't enjoy our little South American holiday? Fighting dinosaurs and Nazis in the jungle? Mm. If everyone is going to think we were carrying on in advance of the wedding, I'd rather there was less danger and more daring do, if you catch my drift. Kit Baxter, behave yourself. Yes, boss. The wedding is in a month, and our unchaperoned superheroics will be quickly forgotten once we're man and wife. Man and... Are you all right? You went pale just now. I'm just a little dizzy. I need a little air. Hmm... Perhaps a little exercise. Let's get a paper. A paper? We've been away nearly two weeks, Kit. I find whenever we lack for adventure, the city has a way of filling in the gaps. I'll take one of those, son. Man in... Wow. Let's see. Ah, this looks promising. What's the headline? Madhouse Murders Claim Third Victim. Ah, the good old chronicle. Hey, there's Weston with the car. He hates plain driver. Yes, well, someone won't let me hire a new one. Hiya, Weston. Miss Baxter? We'll drop Kit off at home first, Weston. I think she's a little worn out from the flight. Very good, sir. You don't have to make me sound frail. I'm just making you sound a little less indestructible. When did you have this glass put in? I put it in so we could speak freely on those occasions when we happened to use the limousine. The speaking tube is there if we need it. A speaking tube? (laughs) Bad enough I have to sit in the back and let the butler drive me around. You're so hard done by. I really am. How's the madhouse murder? Any good? Which madhouse? You'll never guess. Not the Queen Street Lunatic Sanitarium for the criminally deranged. The very same. So one of the Goonie birds went on a spree? I don't think so, Kit. Last night, Judge Marcus was murdered in his home. He was the third member of the sanitarium board to have been killed, and each apparently by a different super criminal inmate. That's bad. How did they escape? That's the part that's even more interesting. They didn't. Boss? Drop off your bags, call your mother, and meet me in the lair. Ah, It's good to be home. What is it now? On your feet, sunshine. Well, well. A social call from the flying squirrel. Just in the neighborhood, or did they finally lock you up in here, too? Cute. I came to talk, Mockingbird, but if you'd rather, I'd bounce you off the walls for a while. You wouldn't be the first, sweetheart. And the doctors would be mighty ticked if they heard you calling me Mockingbird. They've spent a year trying to strip that identity away. As if taking the costume would change who I am. But you understand that, don't you? What if I do? She admits it, at least. Maybe you belong in here after all. Mockingbird... What makes you think you can get inside my head? Mind games are the national pastime in here. Pull up a chair, but only because you keep calling me Mockingbird. You know what I've always wondered? A Mockingbird has a song that sounds like laughter, but you can mimic anyone's voice. Shouldn't you be the Minor Bird? Minor Bird's a stupid name. Well, you got me there. What do you want, squirrel? I want to talk to you about Walter Grant. Who? Don't play tough. It doesn't go well with the pajamas. Walter Grant was on the board of trustees for the sanitarium. Was? Yeah, was. Four nights ago, he stepped off the edge of a building. Now he's not much of anything. Times are tough all over, I guess. Just you keep cracking wise. I might just do that. What's this got to do with me? You tell me. Call the nurse. Maybe if we were on the same meds, you'd make more sense. There was a fog four nights ago, a real pea super. A half dozen witnesses say that Walter Grant stepped off that building because he heard his wife calling him from a dozen feet to the south. So? So a dozen feet to the south was a five-story drop. A voice that witnesses swear belonged to Mrs. Grant was calling from the middle of nowhere, luring her husband to his death. But Mrs. Grant was on the other side of town. To which I say again, so what? Don't play dumb, princess. We both know it's an act. 
Ventriloquism and mimicry? Does that sound like a skill set you recognize? You're out of your mind. You think I did it? It looks pretty good on paper, don't it? Why would... I don't even know this guy. And I've been locked up in here for 14 months, getting poked and prodded and tested. It's impossible. It ought to be. But there's a couple of problems with that. Like what? Two nights before, the head of the board, Byron Chambers, was stabbed to death at the theater by an invisible man. And the vapor just lives down the hall. <laughs> this is nuts. And last night, Judge Marcus was burned to death by someone who left burn marks in the shape of his hands. Just like Cobalt Burn would leave. You remember Cobalt, don't you? 59510 five, lives in the East Wing. Even if we wanted to. Even if... For Pete's sake, Squirrel, tell me why and how. That's all I want. Why and how? You tell me, kitten. If somebody puts you up to this, we can see that you get a deal if you testify. Tell the cops who put you up to it and how they got you out. You're out of your mind. If I was going to bump a guy, why would I do it so public? Why would any of us? Why would I mess up a sweet alibi by doing it in front of witnesses? It's an interesting point. Hmm. But who else can do what you can do? Well, that red mask side of beef you run around with can make people hear voices. In their head, Mockingbird. No witnesses that way. What about you? You can throw your voice and mimic pretty good. I've always been pretty sure you cheat with some kind of gadget or... <laughs> you really think you want to go with this angle as your defense? I don't need a defense. I haven't done anything. For your sake, sweetie, I hope that's the truth. Who are you? What is the meaning of this? Don't get excited, Dr. Reed. The Red Panda. The same. You took over as the chief psychiatrist of the sanitarium ten months ago. I'm surprised we have never had cause to meet. I've just been fortunate, I suppose. I'll thank you to stop rifling through those patient records. Those are confidential. I'm sure... You weren't on duty when the electric eel took over the facility and took the staff hostage. No, I was at a conference. Why? Oh, nothing. I just thought you might be less possessive of these files if we had saved your life. It doesn't seem to be slowing your reading down at all. Mm, I noticed that. And it occurs to me that the electric eel took the staff hostage to lay a trap for you. Simon Radford was looking for help. Yes, I am familiar with your armchair diagnosis. Will you stop reading those files and speak to me? I think that you will find I'm quite capable of doing both, Doctor. You seem very unconcerned with these madhouse murders. There is no connection between the sanitarium and these crimes. That is an invention of the press. The murdered men were all members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Reed. Do you deny that is a connection in its own right? Pure coincidence. There is no possibility that the inmates of this facility have been committing these crimes. None. You know, Reed, I'm starting to think you might be right. Oh, yes? Well, that's fine. Perhaps you can make that clear to the hysterical newspaper men in this town. Perhaps. And I know some of the staff here seem to have given you free reign over the place, but that has to stop. Do you hear me? I'm not convinced that you don't belong in one of these cells yourself. Well, when the time comes that you are convinced, Dr. Reed... You had better bring more than a few orderlies. Ones that you don't mind losing. I'll be going now. Yes, and don't come back. Of that I make no promises, sir. Oh, one more thing, Doctor. Yes, what is it? You are the representative of the medical staff on the board of trustees, are you not? What are you implying? Merely that it would be best for you if your own diagnosis were correct, dear Doctor. If this is more than coincidence, I fear you have not seen the last of the Red Panda. You are listening to the Red Panda Adventures from Dakota Ring Theater. Your address for adventure, mystery, and comedy. Hello, Peaches. It's Peaches now. You don't like? You've got a look in your eye not normally seen on the roofs of sanitariums. I'll give you a nickel if we can drop this whole business and curl up by a fire somewhere. A whole nickel, you say? Just for starters. Kit Baxter, 
You were decidedly rattled this morning at the thought of playing house at last. <laughs> yes, boss. I got over it. So I see. So that's a no to the fireplace and the bearskin rug? That's a later to the fireplace and the bearskin rug. Masher. Mockingbird. She swears on a stack that she had nothing to do with it. Do you believe her? I wish I didn't. This doesn't play any other way. That's certainly the angle the police seem to be taking. O'Malley wants to interview the suspects, but the trustees have their lawyers running interference. The question is, why? It's not the only question, boss. I can see the inmates wanting to get back at their doctors or the review board or the judge that sent them there. But the board of trustees? <laughs> I doubt Mockingbird even knew who any of them were. So where are we? Is that rhetorical? A little bit, yes. How was the good doctor? He thinks we're complete loons. Nice. I thought so. He's also one of the four members of the board still alive, which makes him either a suspect or a potential victim. I'd like to think he's a suspect, but I didn't care for him very much. <laughs> Sounds like it was mutual. Well, I guess if anyone had a chance to learn how our baddies work their tricks, it would be their doctor. Or at least their doctor's boss. An interesting idea. Perhaps we should tail him. Wait, boss. Yes? Something that Mockingbird said. She said she'd been locked up for 14 months, getting poked and prodded and tested. Poked and prodded? That's what she said. That seems significant. Hold the phone. What? A few months back. Kobe Brown got the drop on me. We were exchanging pleasantries, and I didn't think anything of it at the time, but I'm sure he said something about the doctors in here studying his powers. You didn't think anything of that? Well, I was a little distracted by the need to rescue you. And when exactly am I going to live that one down? I'll keep you posted. Brown's in a maximum security wing following Judge Marcus's flame death. We could really stand to corroborate this. Well, then, let's not stand around on the roof of the crazy house. Let's go talk to the Invisible Man. You're late, Doctor. I was getting worried. Well, I must say I am disappointed, Mr. Franklin. That name means nothing to me now. Of course it doesn't. I see you've constructed a costume for yourself. Red robes... Skull mask. Very grim. You have created a new identity, of course. Dr. Reed. What is the name? I beg your pardon? The name, you pathetic fool. The trauma of your new abilities has fragmented your subconscious. You have created a new persona. What is the name? The Crimson Death. The Crimson Death? Very nice. Very melodramatic. And yet I find you sitting here in my front room, waiting quietly. No doubt you intend to hunt us all down, one by one, killing each of us with a different power that we granted you, until your secret was safe at last. Yes. You've done terrible things, Franklin, and perhaps we were wrong to try and play God, but you have made peace with your new destiny. Have I indeed? Yes. You have proven that by coming to me for help. Oh, is that what I did? Of course. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. You have reached out for help. Not really. If you will allow me to shed a little light on the subject, Doctor. Good God. You see, my dear Dr. Reed, it isn't that I decided to spare the remaining members of the board. It's that I killed each of them this very night and hung them from your rafters for you to see. Oh, God. I wanted to see the look on your face. I wanted to remember it always. Look at them, Doctor. Do they look surprised? I don't... I don't... Believe me, Dr. Reed. None of them looks as surprised as you. <laughs> Boss, it's this door. Quickly and quietly. Am I crazy, or was security a lot tighter than we're used to? Same number of men, as far as I could tell. But they were paying much less attention to keeping their charges in than they were keeping something out. Your pal the doc put the word out that we're persona non grata. Yes, he did. He also moved the vapor to the infirmary rather than leave him in his cell where anyone might find him. Hmm, kind of a lot of security for an infirmary, ain't it? It is, isn't it? Squirrel. What is it? Look there. Who's the patient? That's him. That's the vapor. 
Oh, I've never seen him this visible. Vapor. You who? Something's wrong. What is it? Is he drugged? I assumed they were keeping Vapor down here because he was a suspect in the Chambers murder, and they didn't want the police to interview him. So? This place is too settled. He's been down here for months. Give me that chart and watch the door. This whole thing's gone pear-shaped, boss. Vapor's file didn't say he was sick. He's not sick. They've lobotomized him. What? That's why they don't want the police in here. Whatever they've done to this man, they did it without any sort of record. But why? Why would they... I think I might have an answer. The scar is almost healed, but it covers more territory than I thought. They might not have intended to leave the vapor in this state, but they definitely did some very serious brain surgery that left him a shell of a man. More poking and prodding? Possibly. The vapor created his invisible state by means of a natural phenomena. It seemed to be some form of mental projection, though obviously I've never tested that theory, as it would have required dissecting a significant portion of his brain. This is nuts. They're supposed to be helping these people, not using them for lab rats. Why would they do this? I don't know. Let's pull apart the files in Dr. Reed's study and see if we can't figure that out. It's unlocked. Somebody's in there. I'm sure of it. I'll hit left. You go right. What if it's Dr. Reed? Hmm. Hit him once for me. Go! <laughs> Well, well, I am impressed. What in blazes? Very close, my dear. I am the Crimson Death. Catchy. My quarrel is not with you. No, it's with the Board of Trustees, including Dr. Reed. You're the madhouse murderer. A dreadful piece of alliteration, but true. My reasons are simple and just. As you see, I've left the appropriate information from Dr. Reed's files on his desk, all wrapped up for the authorities with a lovely bow. Perhaps you would be so kind as to see they get it. Why would the cops be coming here? Unless you've already killed Reed. That butcher was on a list of people that I killed tonight. All will be made clear when you have read the material on the desk. Oh, and we're just supposed to let you walk away. You are powerless to stop me. I have the powers and abilities of a dozen of your enemies. What? Of course. That's why Reed was studying their powers. He wanted to replicate them. <laughs> yes! It was his dream to build a small army of super-powered men. In the end, he could only persuade the Board of Trustees to let him experiment on a single test subject. I suppose that man's name is conveniently blacked out in all of those files. Correct. With the destruction of the final members of the board, the identity of the Crimson Death will be secret forever, and my vengeance is complete. Vengeance? Are you telling me they did this against your will? Far from it. I, uh, volunteered. Why? Why would you let them mess around in your brain? Do who knows what else to you? Reed told me he wanted to build a hero strong enough to defend the city. From who? From us. Well done. Yes, indeed, Red Panda. Dr. Reed was a man with many dark secrets. He couldn't feel comfortable with an avenging angel he couldn't control or destroy. And at what point did his hero become a murderer? You have no idea what they did to me. After each operation, I could feel a darkness growing within my mind. I could feel the evil spreading, taking me over. I was splintered from within into a dozen entities. I begged them to stop, but he laughed, said I would feel differently when I had the power he could give me. And I did feel different. My dark side cooled, settled into a single soul, as evil as the dozen villains I replaced combined. You're a fool! There was no transfer of mind, of soul. Evil isn't something you can spread like a disease. It lives in every man's heart. The story of a good man's life is a tale of the struggle against that evil. You fell into the temptation of your own power, your own hubris, and you were powerless to resist it. I'll show you power. You will taste my flame. Look out, boss. <laughs> My flame? 
What did you... You inherited a bunch of powers we've already beaten a dozen times. That supercooled spray put the kibosh on Cobalt Burn's flame powers for a few minutes, which is more than I need. This is not the time. We will have a reckoning. But, but you, you cannot, cannot stop. stop. You cannot see. He's turned invisible. Cover the door. I'll get to the... <coughs> How'd you know where he was? It took the vapor four encounters with the lenses in my mask to learn to hide himself in the infrared spectrum. Luckily, this crimson death doesn't seem to have picked that up yet. Nice. I'll cuff him. You call O'Malley. Roger that. We're, uh, gonna have to give this some thought, you know. What's that? We caught most of the baddies in this place, and they tried to use them against us. Who are we supposed to trust? It is a little disheartening, isn't it? Seems we take one step forward and two back. Looks like it's still you and me against the world. I like those odds. And so concludes another adventure of the Red Panda! This recording and the story, characters, and situations contained therein are the exclusive property of their creator and copyright holder, Greg Taylor, and are produced and distributed by Decoder Ring Theater through arrangement with him. These recordings may not be rebroadcast or redistributed by any means for any reason without express permission. Until next time, when Decoder Ring Theater brings you the further thrilling adventures of Canada's greatest superhero, this is Stephen Burley reminding you DecoderRingTheater.com is your address to adventure! The Red Panda Adventures, episode 46, The Crimson Death, was written and directed by Greg Taylor with original music by Andrea Lyons and featured the vocal talents of Tim Vant, Christopher Mott, Kevin Robinson, Michael Booth, Peter Nickel, Denise Anderson, Clarissa Denetter Landon, and Greg Taylor. Until next time, for all of us here, good night. <laughs>